Hello? I'm right here. Can you hear me? Okay. All righty, great. I'd like to introduce the folks, uh, Eric Hecker. Is I'm saying your name correctly? That is correct. All right, good, good. And uh, it's an interesting uh, program we're going to do. Uh, it's really dealing with some information that I first learned in the 90s um, from a classified source who had uh, developed neutrino light detectors that were being uh, uh, placed on satellites in space in the uh, 1973 to 75 time period that were being used to track extraterrestrial vehicles, target them, hit them, down them. Um, the, this particular man was a, a electromagnetic genius at his own company near Tampa. Um, when he developed the neutrino light detectors, he got a national security order um, from the NRO, National Reconnaissance Office, runs a lot of these top secret satellite systems, and they confiscated the uh, invention and the technologies to use for uh, covert purposes, which is uh, actually happens quite frequently. Um, that is that that story is you know been confirmed by a number of people since then, such as the man who recently came forward out of the technology management office in the Pentagon regarding uh, systems that were on satellites that could target and did target uh, during the Iraq War a certain volume of space, and they could switch on the satellite and, and, and the aircraft in that zone once we cleared our own aircraft out would fall out of the sky like rocks and crash. And in fact, that's how most of Saddam Hussein's uh, Air Force was destroyed, according to this source inside the Pentagon, who had baseline clearance across uh, about 18 of these top secret uh, unacknowledged special access projects. So, uh, you know, a lot of these are data points that I've heard various aspects of a, a couple months ago. Uh, uh, was reached out to by uh, Mr. Hecker, and he uh, told me about uh, an incident for that where he was involved, uh, involving the South Pole. So I think, Eric, if you can give people, assume everyone on this call or this show know absolutely nothing. Um, I, I don't jump over into a lot of technical gobbledygook speak, if you don't mind, because nobody's, I don't think very few people are physicists or electromagnetic engineers here. Um, uh, you know, this is a general population and not a, the physicists that we're talking to. So uh, if you can just tell about what, when and where and what you saw and just go through what you directly uh, saw and experienced. You got it. Uh, first and foremost, let me just let everybody know, uh, I spent an entire year at the South Pole Station on the maintenance crew. Um, and the Ice Cube Neutrino Detector was simply one facility of many that I paid attention to there. And in that process, you know, I obviously learned the science and stuff like that. Like you said, it's, it's, it's a lot of mumbo jumbo that people don't really need to know about. But that's the pretense that it's presented to the world, that the National Science Foundation cut a check for this facility at the South Pole Station and is doing science, wonderfully complex science. But what I have come to find out is that this device, not only is it a passive observational scientific device that is massive and embedded in the ice at the South Pole, it also transmits. I provided documentation for it. Anybody can look it up now. It is referenceable on the internet. I call it the DOM document and it's on the archives at my website. But what it states is that this device, which has 5,000 160 DOMS, which is a digital optical module. The idea is that it's observing the neutrino interaction when it hits the nucleus of an ice molecule down there. That's the, what it's supposed to be built to do. But I found in the paperwork that it, each of these DOMS also can transmit up to 2,047 volts per DOM. That makes this a giant, powerful, active phased array system, which I am now doing due diligence to let the world know what that means. And the possibilities list is huge. Well, so before we go out if too far into that, let's, let's deal with the basics here is what I was wanting you to talk about. You got you it. Know, I know you were there working for Raytheon. Yes, sir. 
Okay. So let's go through that. You were assigned there for a year working with Raytheon. It was year X to Y. I mean, just, you know, the whole thing before we get into a lot of the technical. You got it. So from, from the, so November of 2010, I, I landed on the ice at McMurdo station and was rapidly deployed further south to 90 degrees at the South Pole station. I stayed there for the 365 days. That, um, that employment, that um, time period, I guess, was for the, the summer season, we had about, uh, we peaked out at close to 280 personnel at the site in the summer season. The winter season, we went down to 49. And the, the neutrino detector was something that I was pretty much obligated to go out to every single day. The, the equipment was so much. This is another thing that I learned that's peculiar, is there's actually so much computer processing equipment. Remember, this is the South Pole Station in the wintertime. My job required me to go out there, and, and people laugh at me for this and get mad, but I say it. We had chicken wire on an air inlet duct, like a snorkel duct, that the snorkel side went up to and connected to the building, and there was louvers there that were temperature-activated louvers. So the processing of these computers made so much heat that in order to cool it down, they're opening the louvers to transfer exterior air in to mm -hmm. keep these computers cold. People really, I mean, think about that. I mean, this is a building at the, it's sometimes minus 80 degrees outside to think that you need that type of cooling capacity. And that was what my job was to do, to make sure this building wasn't overheating in the middle of winter at the South Pole. And uh, you, you, why don't you describe, I know you, you've told me before, but for the audience, the, the size, the depth of the array, how big it was, how, how far down under the ice it was, um, it. et cetera. I mean, I'm, I'm, see, again, I want to get, you know, so people have a visual you got of it. what we're talking about here, because otherwise, you know, none of this makes any sense. So you got to, you know, let's paint a picture of it. the facility, the size of the array, how deep it was. Um, you know, and, you know, was it operational when you got there? Or was it operational later? All that detail. You got it. So first and foremost, the, 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 the central facility where all the processing happens is sitting atop the ice at South Pole Station, which is 10,300 feet actual elevation. And that is ice above Earth. So the, the ice cube drillers first had to go and drill. They would steam drill down and go basically two miles down close to a 32 to 34 inch diameter hole and they would drop a string cable down with all of these doms on it. Each one of those holes was drilled down and it made a, it was um, drilled in a giant hexagon that covered kilometers of area in a length and width dimension. And then as far as the um, depth going all the way down close to close to earth at approximately two miles down to that. And, Everything was cabled and went back to the central building where all the processing computer server towers were and all that stuff. And that was the facility that was being accessed every day and, and made to be chilled. Now, now you, apparently this was being uh, built and developed by uh, Raytheon. Is that right? Uh, yes, that's correct. And the season that I was there, which was um, so fall 2010 was when I arrived. We transitioned. It was right around, I think, January or February that Ice Cube officially transitioned from operation. I'm sorry, from construction to operations and maintenance. Same same thing with the elevated station itself, actually, that year. OK. And uh, these the system, what, what was what what were we, were the people there told about why it was there and what it was doing, allegedly? The, the intended purpose for the ice cream, ice cream, ice cube neutrino detector was to detect neutrinos through the, the muon creation, which was when a neutrino coming from anywhere in any direction, it could be from the other side of the planet, from off planet, through the planet, it doesn't matter. But when any of those neutrinos smashes into the nucleus of the water molecule, which is in the extremely pure ice. There's nothing else in there. So that's kind of why they're doing it because they, they know it's a concentration of something specific, which is just pure water. Great, great product. When it hits the nucleus, there's two things that occur. A blue flash of light and the, the neutrino and the nucleus are destroyed 
and a new product called a muon is created. The detector is searching for the blue flash of light. So whatever direction it comes from, it would um, it would make like a like a blast through the array that when it would hit the nucleus, it would be like um, a reaction through all of the different DOMs because they're optical modules and they're receiving at that point. On the receiving end, there's just a bloom that shows up in the array. And from that bloom and the amount of light that hits each DOM, they can triangulate the direction from which the neutrino came from. Mm -hmm. I was told that they would then take that information, transmit it to all the different telescopes in the world, and then that would allow them to then look because they're so curious as to what neutrinos are and where they come from. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was, uh, what they were telling you is that this was a observation technology uh, related to astrophysics or astronomy somehow. Absolutely, that's correct. Yeah. And what did you discover it actually is used for? Quite much more. The, the, the ability to transmit is a big deal. And I, I know a lot of people may not necessarily understand what that means. So I want to, you know, I want to paint a picture for them. You know, it's, it's one thing to say that, you know, and the government does this all the time. They sidestep stuff. Mm -hmm. It would be like if somebody walked up to you and they had something you had never, ever seen before in your life. And they're just simply calling it a, a bullet carrier. You know, it's a bullet carrier. It carries bullets. But if they never told you it's a pistol or a handgun, they're being rather deceptive in what that thing does. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I now look at the ice cube neutrino detector is that this is a savagely different device from what I was presented. And I'm trying to express to the world what that means because it is absolutely a very big deal. So you, you, you're convinced it was also had not only uh, data gathering, but also offensive weapon capability. I, I'm absolutely suggesting that that is still on the list of things to to check into. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a firm advocate of Occam's razor, that every possibility is left on the table and I have to assess each one. And the split second I can negate something as a possibility, I will apply Occam's razor, cut it off and remove it. But so far, everything that's left on the table is still possible. No, a lot yes, the yes, there is. Yeah, and we can get into that in a moment. But I'm trying to stick with, you know, the things that are factually happened and observed. And then we can talk about implications mm -hmm. uh, and our assessment in a, in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, what I mean, you told me a very interesting thing that happened the instant they switched this system on. The New Zealand event. I, I have I have a high suspicion that this is when it was going active and they were dialing things in and that they caused the Christchurch accident that was you're, during you're referring to the earthquake absolutely yes mm -hmm. yeah. yep I, I believe that they were dialing it in and there was a high probability that that was just um, a misfire mm -hmm. and a side effect See, one of the things that people just you know, give a little background a lot of people have heard me refer in the past of uh, scalar and longitudinal um, uh, electromagnetic uh, energy, which just give people not to geek out too far here. But, uh, you know, when you look at a, a normal light wavelength, there's a, a wave to it like this. And a laser is coherent light where all the green spectrum is lined up. When you're doing something um, with a, a, the longitudinal scalar waves are actually a point that goes out longitudinally without the wave and is uh, a much faster than the speed of light, literally, and uh, the normal speed of light is still, it's still light, it's still electromagnetic field, but it also can be uh, weaponized. So the early, uh, one of the euphemisms that are used, you were talking about the euphemism of this being some kind of, you know, like a, a bullet carrier when really it's a gun. Uh, people don't realize that when uh, J. Edgar Hoover was written to by the field agent uh, there in Roswell, the memo we have that's now become the most viewed uh, document on the FBI website officially uh, states that there was a new, quote, radar array at Roswell. Um, in fact, what that what that is often used at people I, I, I have here, I'm in Washington right now, who, who have worked in these systems, 
radar is often a euphemism or a catch-all phrase for not only a passive detection of an aircraft or you know bouncing waves off the, the metal skin of an aircraft radar but also an active warfare system and they will piggyback them together so this is a common motif it's a it's a pattern that i've seen over the last 30 years of, of working in this area um, and i know that is also true that the operational systems that were not only the neutrino light detectors on satellites in the uh, you know almost 50 years ago now in the early mid 70s those were quote slaved to active systems that were longitudinal scalar uh, directional energy weapon type systems that would then lock on now why is that important when an interstellar vehicle is stepping down let's call it out of trans-dimensional uh, space-time, you know, resonating beyond the speed of light, matter, electrons, as we think of it. That's that whole area of physics has been kept secret. When they are going from that into this dimension full on, the very first thing that happens is a big burst of neutrino light. And that's what those, that's why the National Reconnaissance Office that runs uh, all the really super secret uh, satellite systems up in space wanted this man's invention and system back in, 19, in the early 70s. So we know that it, those systems have been used for detection connected to uh, offensive weapon targeting purposes for that long. I think it's a, a stepping the game up quite a bit. If in fact there is a similar system ground base at the South Pole, and, and one thing you, you mentioned, I want to emphasize, neutrinos go straight through the earth, matter, anywhere, unimpeded. So it, the fact that it's on the uh, South Pole doesn't mean that it can only pick up neutrino bursts that are coming from the direction of the South Pole out into space. It can pick it up circumferentially everywhere. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people make that error. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I actually have... Um... And understanding my my ex father in law passed away, but before he passed away, he had informed me that when he was in the army way back when in uh, World War II, he was in very special detail that was working with the first microwave line of sight radar. <coughs> Excuse me, mm -hmm. very special stuff. He was um, super top secret. They never left the country, mm -hmm. and they were ordered to write letters as if they were in the European front. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah, well, a lot of people don't realize that these sort of electromagnetic uh, fields and experimentation, these go back to the late 1800s and right. the early 1900s. If you, if you look at this historically, this is why, you know, I, I, at some point, uh, maybe in the near future, I want to work on uh, a documentary that's a, you know, a special two hour deep dive going back over 100 years on the sort of uh, hidden electromagnetic and related technologies. You know, because obviously they can be used to tap into the so-called zero point or quantum vacuum and give us free energy and save the biosphere. But, you know, I always say this as a medical doctor, emergency doctor, that, you, you know, you can take a knife to put uh, butter on your bread or to slice someone's throat. And unfortunately, um, the latter is what's been going on in these covert programs because they've all been hoovered up like a giant vacuum cleaner. Uh, into uh, covert, unacknowledged special access projects and uh, uh, developed for military purposes. And this is an enormous problem because most of those sort of systems, by the way, you know, if you bring something like this up to someone, you know, in the White House or, or even most uh, directors of the CIA and, and or members of Congress and Senate Intelligence Committee, they know absolutely nothing. I mean, when I say nothing, I mean zero about this. That's a problem. I mean, it's a huge problem because there's no oversight um, on it. So tell us a little bit more of what your, your research into this has uncovered and uh, any other people that you've stayed in touch with who have still worked in that facility and, and, and what the status of it now, 10 years on. I think it's perfect where you were just at because I think the reason those people are ignorant about these types of projects is because mm -hmm. of compartmentalization of information. Mm -hmm. and it's amazing because here I am, somebody who actually wintered at the South Pole Station, 
and from a crew. I mean, this, these are limited numbers of people on the planet that do this. And right. even of that crew, I'm one of the few that was able to see through the compartments. So yes, I've actually, I've stayed in contact with people because a lot of this has been getting in touch with folks and saying, hey, you know what? You remember that time that such and such happened yes. and we had to respond and this was what we were told and this was what was going on. What if we look at it this way? I need to talk to you. So a lot of that has happened. I've absolutely been in touch with a lot of the hands from my crew. Um, one of the main reasons that I'm coming forward is because I've maintained that contact and I do believe these people have been negatively impacted by what I believe are now called directed energy weapons. That, you know, that people have suffered. There are physical things that happen to people that are near this equipment when they're figuring out how it works. Right. And then also, I believe that because we had a potential to go offensively, I believe there's a potential for us to have been attacked. Mm -hmm. Now, what do you, what kind of symptoms you're, you're referring on now to sort of biological and brainwave um, um, problems that people have had? I know we talked about this before when I first uh, had a conversation with you. Can you go into that? What sort of sequela We'd say in medicine have people experienced uh it, a lot of it has to do with the list of things that are coming out now on the um havana syndrome list mm -hmm. so i apologize for not having all the medical terminology correct no, that's fine. Yeah. I'm, I'm just dealing with the folks and what they're telling me right. they're having they're having memory issues they're having a lot of trouble sleeping mm -hmm. they're having um issues with temperature uh, rise out of nowhere. These things are all peculiar to me. I mean, I'm not trying to justify it or anything. I'm just telling you what people are griping, and this is becoming more and more prevalent. It's kind of why I came out of the shadows, because I was noticing this in my life and my crew, but now I'm seeing things like, since last we spoke, we have the Directed Energy Threat Emergency Response Act has come out as a House resolution. You know, the Department of Defense has now has issued guidelines for their personnel how to report these symptoms internally so they can take care of it appropriately. Right, right. So this stuff's getting very real in just the last couple of weeks. Yeah, and it's been in the, it's been in a lot in the mainstream news. Those of you who uh, haven't heard about this, that our embassy in Havana had a lot of personnel that had some kind of uh, directional energy weapon targeted them. There's been more recent ones in other countries um, at various facilities and, um, they have experienced this whole, uh, sort of constellation of symptoms, you know, migraine, sleeplessness, um, you know, emotional instability, uh, um, you know, big mood swings, uh, you know, and other physical problems, including what, you know, what you're referring to, uh, feeling like you're having a fever or what have you. Now, I remember this all goes back to, this whole area of let's call it forbidden science that deals with a scalar longitudinal uh, transdimensional physics is is what it's been called that deal with these kinds of uh electromagnetic fields is a little i liken it a little bit to people uh you know working unwittingly near the hanford reactor um you know and and ended up getting radiation poisoning or uh, people who were near a downwind from the plumes of the atomic bombs being tested. Uh, you know, uh, there, there's a lot going on. And of course, the government never wants to admit that people are being injured by anything like this they're doing uh, because they don't even acknowledge the project, project exists. This is one of the big problems is that if you're not going to even acknowledge the, the fact that these technologies are extant, that they're already all over the place, um, and because they're that classified, then obviously you're going to deny the symptomatology resulting from those technologies being deployed or used, even if the, the uh, negative effects on people are secondary, not the intended one. Although I will say the so-called radionic psychotronic type systems are not a mythology. Those exist and have been developed quite thoroughly over the last uh, you know, 70, 80 years or more. And, and are also um, weapon systems. There's, there's, a, there's a phrase in the military when, when they come with systems that maintain plausible deniability, and they say things like plausible deniability must be maintained. Yes. Right. That means when there's collateral damage and fallout, mm -hmm. 
plausible deniability will be maintained. They're not going to discuss what happened. There will be a cover story. You'll get some right. swamp gas spiel. Right. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. So, so what, what else have you discovered? I know you mentioned there was one uh, supervisor who was there, a woman who who became even while you were there became seemingly unhinged. You just read my mind. That was right where I was going. Our our station manager was made the news when we were there. This is all referenceable. <laughs> She was having great issue, I would just say. We'll put it that way. I'm certainly not a doctor, but I'm a, I'm a winter over South Pole expert. And from my knowledge and experience of being a winter over at the South Pole, she seemed to be in the throes of what is medically called winter over syndrome. They've done studies. There's a certain mechanism of failure to the psyche that occurs typically when you go down the wrong path there, I guess to say. And she seemed to be in that situation. Mm -hmm. And at the time, she was under the impression, I believe that she believed she had a stroke. But it, it, it turned out that it didn't seem she had a stroke. I believe that she believed it. But I think this was again, an impact from something that occurred during our winter season there that she and others, um, there was an, there was an event that negatively impacted everybody. We had a we had a drill. There was a drill out by our radio systems, our, our radio um, array, and it was her idea to set up a, a a drill. We had all kinds of response teams, fire teams, medical teams, and the idea was in the in the harsh climate to test all of our equipment and get out there. Long story short, is either a that equipment wasn't properly isolated by accident mm -hmm. or on purpose or some other thing was going on and I still don't know but that event messed up a lot of folks oh okay mm -hmm. and the you know the the powers that be want to call it a whole bunch of other stuff but that's just one singular event that I know that it wasn't as presented. People were negatively impacted. Nobody was really talking about it. There was a lot of compartmentalization and I would, I would say misinformation and disinformation being spread around because to this day, I still don't know exactly what happened there and I'm still looking into it. Okay. And you know, how many, were there other people at the base uh, when they switched the system on and this Christchurch, New Zealand devastating earthquake happened that sort of sensed like, oops, you know, there's something related here i would not have been in that info stream at that time okay but since then you've learned to folks who yes yes yeah. that absolutely that was the thought going on mm -hmm. they they were very aware it was mm -hmm. rather rapid you know i think when you when you pull the trigger and on something like that yeah. you yeah. kind of know the target that you're looking for and whether you hit the bullseye or on the paper you're still aware so this array is two miles deep. How far across is it? Oh, it's a, it's I would say a couple of miles across. Okay. Be my estimate. Um, I don't have it on this map here. I'm sorry. Okay. I have a different map. Yep. Well, the reason I bring that up, I mean, I, this is not something I. A lot of times I'll have military and intel or contractors come forward with information, and I I sit on it until I get another point of corroboration. Because, you know, you don't want something to just be purely apocryphal one off, as we say in science, an N of one. So uh, some years ago, I was given a lecture in um, Phoenix. And, you know, this commonly happens. There were you know, hundreds of people there. And at the end of it, there was this uh, a middle aged man with two people with him were clearly with him as friends, protectors who waited till everyone cleared out. And he told me that he had been in Alaska uh, and deployed on a ship that uh, was under contract. It was a private corporation uh, under contract with the National Security Agency. And uh, this ship had a special scalar electromagnetic system on it. And they went down to uh, the area off of Indonesia over that subduction zone and when they turned that system on, it caused that massive earthquake. I mean, it killed a quarter of a million people. 
And he was so disturbed by this that he went off the grid, got an old car without GPS, drove from Alaska to Phoenix with these two security people to hand this information off to me. He was shaken. I mean, he's, I, there's no question that he was telling me the truth of what he knew about this. Now, you know, again, whether that was an intentional or an incidental event, the implication from him was that they were testing a weapon system that could destabilize uh, unstable areas uh, of the Earth's crust and put them past the tipping point for an earthquake. And, and when you told me this story about this system being switched on and the Christchurch uh, earthquake, I, I put that in there with this information from this uh, guy who was on the ship and, and witnessed this happen, uh, who, who took a lot of time and trouble to try to hand this information off to us. I actually believe that a component like that, along with the component at the South Pole mm -hmm. system, is how these larger systems actually work. That it, there's, there's something else going on because the South Pole station relatively stationary. I mean, granted, a phased, ray, a phased ray system like that has some level of tunability as far as direction, but to have it be able to work in conjunction with something else like this floating system that you're talking about is par for the course. I mean, that's what I'm finding doing the research on the science is that right. there's different ways. Um, it's like having an, a, a, a recording studio. When you connect the wire to this piece this way and the other one this way, you get different functions. Well, in, in reality, what I've learned, it, you know, over the years is people come forward that they are based on uh, satellites in space. They're mobile on aircraft and ships. They're mm -hmm. on land and they're under the water. There's a huge array under the water. Um, what some people would call the Bermuda Triangle area. I have a military witness who was in a helo helicopter military flying uh, over that area and it was very clear and he could see this massive array. Uh, it was very restricted area uh, under the, the water in the South Atlantic there, Northern Caribbean. Mm -hmm. Would this be like the SOSIS array? Is it something similar to that? You know, I, he was not a technical guy. He just said there were these massive triangular, uh, obviously electronic arrays that were underneath the water visible when it was really clear water like that. And he didn't have any other information at all. It was an incidental observation when he was being flown over this restricted airspace. Yeah, it, it is my understanding that the United States Navy has a, a, a substantial amount of uh, hydrophones that they call, mm -hmm. um, like so they call it the SOSIS array, that the, most of the oceans of the world, they're, they're listening to passively. Yeah, this seemed more than that. I, you know, from what oh. he described, I suspect it was uh, both active and passive. Mm -hmm. um, although they, you know, if it ever leaked out, I'm sure they'd say it was a purely a passive uh, mm -hmm. data gathering system. But that's that's the usual cover. Exactly. I'm I'm just, I'm just spewing the Navy commercial. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what else have you discovered since then? I know it's been a decade or so since you left. Um, there's, there's one more thing that I do want to add about my time there that I did discover. Now, this is this is something that I, I don't have documentation for. The other things that I've been discussing so far, I can document. But just in the standard of my, my work at the South Pole Station and my experience, I proved it. The ELF, the Extra Low Frequency System, is also energized. I learned that firsthand when I was there. It's not something that I can document. I didn't know at the time how important it was. But just um, doing my regular workload, I came across some equipment I had to de-energize. So safety's sake, we have to go over, you know, find the correct circuit breaker panel, lock out the breaker panel, you know, put a lock on it, tag it, you know, make everything official so everything's safe and nobody can hurt themselves. I'm going through the standard motions of doing this, but now in this sub panel that I'm at, I'm, I'm checking the circuits and it's, you know, oh, this is energized, de-energized, energized. And all of a sudden there's a, there's a switch that's out. It's, mm -hmm. it's on when it's supposed to be off. So now it gives me pause because something's not right. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, all right, I have to go check with the engineer. Like, what's going on? How come everything's not matching? At that point, I become informed that the ELF breaker that's on, that I was under the impression it's supposed to be off because it's off. That's what I was told. It's off. I was wrong. I was told it's on and it stays on and it's supposed to be on. So go back to what you're doing. 
And I went back to what I was doing now with full <laughs> knowledge that the ELF system is not de-energized. And right. that's a big deal also. So why don't, again, you, why don't you tell people listening what ELF is, what it can be used for, what it does? I think a lot of people may have, may not be familiar with the science of the ELFs. ELF is, is, again, going back to like Nikola Tesla type stuff, and it's very complex. It's a huge antenna array again. Now we're talking, again, miles and miles of antenna embedded in the ice. One of the things that it could be used for, they said was used for way back when, was submarine communications globally, which is a really interesting thing. Um, they're also stating to be using it for science, for the measuring of the magnetosphere, which is very interesting to certain aspects of science that I love and what's been going on with the temperature of our planet and many, many interesting things can be understood from observing the magnetosphere. But again, since they're not telling anybody it's on, I don't think it's being simply used for such common things. I think there's a more nefarious aspect to this component. Mm -hmm. That's where I'm at so far. So what do you think that could be used for that would be uh, not just communication and passive? Uh, according to the work of Dr. James Giordano, who gives us the new topic of the, the battlefield of the mind, uh, ELF and the South Pole Station's Ice Cube Neutrino Detector, these things are right on the list of directed energy weapons and V2K and all kinds of horrible things that I don't want to think about, but I have to impress upon people that there are folks that think of these things that like to manufacture these devices under the pretense that, well, what if our enemies come up with it first? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That yeah, you, said, you said V2K. You want to tell people what V2K means? Yes, the V2K is voice to skull, and this is an actual technology that's been around for quite some time, and it was even put to use in the um, Desert Storm conflict to disarm our enemies. There is a way to put a voice to transmit into somebody else's head in their own voice a message. So this is an interesting thing, actually, because when you look on the list of the Havana Syndrome stuff, which they're now actually calling AHI, Anomalous Health Incidents, which is a, a wonderful, benign term. But the funny thing is, is they keep being very vague. They're saying that on the list of symptoms is people hearing strange sounds. That's V2K, folks. They're not going to be more specific than that right now. But what that means is they're hearing information coming into their own head in their own voice. Mm -hmm. I would suggest this is what our ancestors were impressing upon us to know thyself. Mm -hmm. Way back then, there was a technique that they could do this by. Mm -hmm. Contemporarily, we're dealing with the technology that can pull it off. Well, you know, it's interesting. It can also be in someone else's voice. Um, you know, a lot yes. of people, uh, you know, if you look carefully at the, the what happened with uh, Carol Rosen, who was Werner von Braun's spokesperson for the last four or five years of her life, mm -hmm. uh, when he got sick, he sent her out to give his speeches. And she was had been a school teacher and then became an aerospace, uh, one of the first women in the aerospace industry, Fairchild Industries back in the 70s. And she, she stood up in, in front of this huge gathering to give his speech and this V2K system switched on. But it was Werner von Braun speaking, and she just repeated what he was saying. And I mean, most people would sound like, "Wow, this sounds like a schizophrenia," you know, as a doctor and a you know someone who in the emergency department have seen plenty of, you know, really severely mentally ill people um, with delusional systems. But no, this is a very specific system, and it's not tinfoil hat stuff. This this has been around for some time. I remember, that was in seventy four or five, I think. Um, so, uh, the, you know, uh, you can imagine what, you know, 50 years or 70 years of classified, unacknowledged special access projects, trillions of dollars, uh, what the payoff has been in this whole uh, basket of, of, of uh, technologies, so sort of secret, uh, highly classified technologies, not just energy and propulsion, like we talk about with uh, UFOs, ET craft, man-made anti-gravity vehicles, uh, but also these other sort of systems. And uh, back in the in, in 93, 4, 5, when I was first dealing with uh, President Clinton and his CIA director and trying to get this stuff, I said, it's not just that <laughs> it's not just that there are these earth saving and life saving technologies that are being kept secret. 
is that those same technologies purposed, repurposed for harmful reasons are in the hands of people who are unaccountable, who have no proper oversight, and who many of them that I've known over the years that are in these programs are quite frankly sociopaths uh, and, you know, for lack or high functioning uh, psychopaths. But, so I think that, you know, you get into it's it's very dangerous, this kind of secrecy when those people have those sort of technologies without any uh, moral, ethical or oversight um, of what they're doing because they have free reign. You know, who's looking into this? The Senate Intelligence Committee, the president? Well, they wouldn't even be shown, you know, as one person said, where the wa washroom is with the projects dealing with this. So that's that's one of the really big problems with this kind of extreme secrecy that Eisenhower recognized. Now, he knew that there were things going on. People think all oh, this is all newfangled. I said, look, you know, the big the heyday of massive breakthroughs in a lot of this sort of science and technology happened between the 20s and the 50s. By the 60s, many of these, we already had field propulsion, so-called anti-gravity. We had energy generation systems. We had the V2K capability. We had psychotronics, radionics, uh, ELF. I mean, all kinds of things and scalar and longitudinal systems that had been deployed uh, early on when they downed the first, uh, some of the early craft near Roswell which was the only nuclear atom atomic bomb squadron in the world, which is why the ETs were there very concerned about it because they knew that we were doing things when we detonate an atomic bomb or worse, a nuclear bomb. It There's the electromagnetic pulse everyone knows about, but there are these other energy forms that are beyond uh, yeah. uh, the speed of light that are released that are actually incredibly disruptive to, to the so-called the superhighway of communication and travel interstellar. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that Tesla was trying to get people to understand is that, you know, even though we use Hertzian wavelengths for everything that we do, it's not the only wavelength out there. There's so much more. Right. And that was, you know, like you were saying earlier, the scalar and the longitudinal, that's, you know, where he was going with, with his, with his transformation of energy over a long distances. It's, it was simply, you know, people are familiar with like AC and DC transformation or a step up or a step down transformer where you're just right. simply increasing voltages. All Tesla was doing was taking something from a Hertzian wavelength, transforming it into something else. You call it scalar, call it longitudinal, call it whatever you want to call it. It was a transformation. And then he would move it from one place to another and mm -hmm. transform it back, which is right. we do this with electricity all day long in so many other ways. Right. Right. Sure. Yep, exactly. And, you know, this is this is why, you know, when Nikola Tesla died, the FBI came in like gangbusters and took all of his papers out of his apartment. Um, I have a Department of Defense document, um, the provenance is, of which is it was officially released, where the Department of Defense was demanding that the FBI turn those papers over to them because they knew how important they were. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that was uh, what, what happened at Teth. Tesla's demise was really uh, inappropriate. It wasn't supposed to go down that way at all. And I don't even know how we're not um, in any way trying to uh, recover from that going down the wrong path. You know, has anybody done due diligence to try to get all those papers back? Or are we, or are we just sitting here confident that the government says they're not around? I mean, I, I myself haven't done the legwork. Do you know of anyone that's tried? Not yet. I mean, I know for a fact that the that the FBI did get them. Now, you know, here's what happens if you do a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act re request, because of the nature of these unacknowledged special access projects, um, these things get diverted into a USAP that no FOIA officer, in fact, the president and Senate Intelligence Committee chairman don't have access to. So if you send in a FOIA request, people think that's some sort of a magic bullet that's going to open the vault for you. That's mm -hmm. just delusional, frankly. It's absolutely delusional um, because they don't understand the level of compartmentalization that is beyond that. Um, even the Department of Justice, when they were investigating a major security breach uh, and it was being led out of the technology ma management office, and there was a three-star general that I know who was going to be prosecuted for violating security at a uh, secure communication information facility near Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Um, he, uh, they could not pursue it because the, the unacknowledged special access project refused to turn over 
the specifics of what happened and where, because it was so highly classified that it was beyond what even the most top secret prosecutors in the Department of Justice would be given access to. So the only thing they could do is take a star off the lapel of this guy and, and put him out to pasture. So um, they, which is what they did, they retired him. But I mean, I know the details of that in excruciating de information, but, but that gives you an idea. This is why when people go, well, we can do a FOIA request. And now, now sometimes, you know, I mean, even a broken clock is right twice a day. Um, you know, the, somebody will release a tranche of, of material of the documents and there'll be some gems in it. But to my knowledge, nobody has gotten, um, you know, pried out of the vault, the black vault, um, you know, the, the, the Tesla papers that the FBI absconded with uh, um, when, when he died. Yeah. Yet we seem to be living in a world of where all of Tesla's wildest uh, imaginations are just happening now in the black projects instead of, you know, for, for the benefit of everyone like he intended. Sure. And this is the whole problem. And this is why I think he died a very sad, in a way, bitter person. But I know so many people like that. I mean, some of the most brilliant geniuses I have ever met have spent most of their lives in a skiff, uh, working under contract for some corporation, for the agency or whoever. But, you know, this sort of science and technology, this is the real problem because you look at this world around us and it's a faint shadow of what it could be and should be if these technologies were being used for peaceful energy generation. And by the way, these same technologies that can create Havana syndrome type uh, bad effects can be used for healing and for good effects. I mean, speaking as a doctor, I've seen this in, in an underground facility I went to on the Mexican border near El Paso. And, and I think this is another uh, big area uh, of exploration. But see, the reason that's